Hey, you found us. Welcome, everybody. This is Scripture Gems. Hello, and welcome to the show. My name is John Fulmer, and this is my brother Jay. How's it going, John? We are two brothers who just can't get enough of the scriptures. That's right, we love them. This episode, we are going over the Come Follow Me lesson for December 11th through 17th, 2023. This is covering Revelation chapters 6 through 14. And now let's bring out the star of the show, the scriptures. (laughs) Hooray, glad to see you. Oh, scriptures, so excited. And now let's consult the Scripture Matic 6000 to find out how long it will take to read this week's reading. 32 minutes, 33 seconds. Very doable. What would that be daily? 4 minutes, 39 seconds. We all can do that. Here we've got time codes if you want to take it chapter by chapter. Otherwise, buckle up and we're going to take a look at it all together. But right before we get started, remember that a link to a PDF of all our quotes and graphics, as well as links from the episode, can be found in the description section below the YouTube video. We hope these will help you in your study. Also, there is an audio-only version of this podcast that is available wherever you subscribe to podcasts. Right. Let's start with a quote included in the Come Follow Me manual. This is from President Boyd K. Packer. This is from the October 2013 General Conference. He says, quote, If the language of the scriptures at first seems strange to you, keep reading. Soon you will come to recognize the beauty and power found on those pages, end quote. And that is so true and so important, especially for the readings we're about to do. Absolutely. Now, the seminary manual gives a brief review of chapter 5 we talked about last lesson. Quote, In Revelation 5, John saw a book with seven seals that only Jesus Christ was worthy to open. Each seal represented a thousand-year period of the earth's temporal history. Beginning in Revelation chapter 6, verse 12, John saw the opening of the sixth seal. The sixth seal represents the thousand years leading up to the second coming of Jesus Christ and likely includes the time in which we now live. So let's open those seals, starting with Revelation chapter 6, verse 1. And I saw when the Lamb opened one of the seals, and I heard, as it were, the noise of thunder, one of the four beasts, saying, Come and see. And I saw, and behold, a white horse, and he that sat on him had a bow, and a crown was given unto him, and he went forth conquering and to conquer. Now, the Institute Manual offers possible interpretations of what we're going to see going forward. So, in this case, the white horse might symbolize victory, the bow, warfare, and the crown, a conqueror. Commenting on Revelation chapter 6, verses 1 and 2, Elder Bruce R. McConkie said, quote, The most transcendent happenings referred to in these verses involved Enoch and his ministry, And it is interesting to note that what John saw was not the establishment of Zion and its removal to heavenly spheres, but the unparalleled wars in which Enoch, as a general over the armies of the saints, went forth conquering and to conquer. This is from his doctrinal New Testament commentary. Let's go on with verse 3. And when he had opened the second seal, I heard the second beast say, Come and see. And there went out another horse that was red, and power was given to him that sat thereon to take peace from the earth, and that they should kill one another. And there was given unto him a great sword. Now the Institute Manual offers these possible interpretations. The red horse could symbolize bloodshed. The sword could symbolize war and destruction. As recorded in the scriptures, widespread wickedness and violence characterized this time period, which included the Great Flood during the days of Noah. The rider of the red horse had power to take peace from the earth, and that they should kill one another. Quote, Who rode the red horse, the red horse of war and bloodshed and a sword, during the second seal? Perhaps it was the devil himself, for surely that was the great day of his power, a day of such gross wickedness, that every living soul, save eight only, was found worthy of death by drowning. Or, if it was not Lucifer, perhaps it was a man of blood, or a person representing many murdering warriors, of whom we have no record. 
Suffice it to say that the era from 3000 BC to 2000 BC was one of war and destruction, close quote. That's Bruce R. McConkie from his book, Doctrinal New Testament Commentary. So let's go on, verse 5. And when he had opened the third seal, I heard the third beast say, Come and see. And I beheld, and lo, a black horse. And he that sat on him had a pair of balances in his hand. And I heard a voice in the midst of the four beasts say, A measure of wheat for a penny, and three measures of barley for a penny. And see thou hurt not the oil and the wine. Now, the Institute Manual offers these possible interpretations and commentary. It says the black horse could symbolize famine, and the balances could symbolize the high prices for food. A measure of wheat would feed an adult for a day and cost a penny under these famine conditions. Penny is translated from the Greek word denarion, which referred to a Roman coin that some estimate was worth the typical daily wage of a laborer. A person could purchase only enough food to live on with a whole day's wages, indicating extreme famine prices. In contrast, barley was less expensive and was thus eaten by the poor. As recorded in the scriptures, famines are characteristic of this time period. Let's go on with verse 7. And when he had opened the fourth seal, I heard the voice of the fourth beast say, Come and see. And I looked and beheld a pale horse, and his name that sat on him was Death, and Hell followed with him. And power was given unto them over the fourth part of the earth, to kill with sword and with hunger and with death and with the beasts of the earth. The Institute Manual offers again some possible interpretations and commentary. It says that the pale horse could symbolize death. Death and hell could symbolize destruction of the wicked and their reception into spirit prison. As recorded in the scriptures, great warring empires characterized this era, Assyria, Egypt, Babylon, Persia, Greece, and Rome, having rejected the warnings of prophets such as Isaiah, Jeremiah, and Amos, the kingdoms of Israel and Judah often found themselves victims of these conquering empires. Israel and Judah also fought against one another. Okay, so we just read about four horsemen. Right. And we're reading the book of Revelation, or the Apocalypse of John. Correct. So is that why some people refer to these as the four horsemen of Revelation? (laughs) Well, I think you mean four horsemen of the Apocalypse. Oh, right. But yes, in the restored Church of Jesus Christ, we understand these horsemen to each symbolically represent 1,000 years of the Earth's history. But some of other faiths understand them as literal beings which will appear prior to the second coming. Interesting. Let's go on with verse 9. And when he had opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of them that were slain for the word of God and for the testimony which they held. And they cried with a loud voice, saying, How long, O Lord, holy and true, dost thou not judge and avenge our blood on them that dwell on the earth? And white robes were given unto every one of them, and it was said unto them that they should rest yet for a little season, until their fellow servants also and their brethren, that should be killed as they were, should be fulfilled. The Institute Manual offers some possible interpretations. The altar could symbolize sacrifice, and the souls could symbolize the martyrs, Christians killed for their beliefs. It goes on to say, many early Christians, including nearly all of the original apostles, gave their lives as martyrs. John saw the Christian martyrs under the altar, suggesting that their lives were given in sacrifice to God's service, much like the sacrificial animals offered upon the altar of the temple. Because they gave up their lives for the word of God and for the testimony which they held, they were given white robes, symbolic of purity. And let's go on with verse 12. And I beheld when he had opened the sixth seal, and lo, there was a great earthquake, and the sun became black as sackcloth of hair, and the moon became as blood, and the stars of heaven fell unto the earth, even as a fig tree casteth her untimely figs when she is shaken of a mighty wind. 
And the heaven departed as a scroll when it is rolled together, and every mountain and island were moved out of their places. And the kings of the earth, and the great men, and the rich men, and the chief captains, and the mighty men, and every bondman, and every free man, hid themselves in the dens and in the rocks of the mountains, and said to the mountains and rocks, Fall on us, and hide us from the face of him that sitteth on the throne, and from the wrath of the Lamb, for the great day of his wrath is come, and who shall be able to stand? The Institute Manual offers these possible interpretations. This thousand-year period will continue until just before Jesus Christ returns in glory and reigns personally on the earth. John noted seven signs that will accompany this time period. An earthquake, the darkened sun, the moon becoming as blood, stars falling, the heavens opening as a scroll, mountains and islands moving out of their places, and men seeking to hide themselves. Similar signs of the times are recorded elsewhere in Scripture. Seven groups of men are also identified in these verses. Kings, great men, rich men, chief captains, mighty men, bondmen, and free men. The number seven suggests completeness or wholeness. No enemies of God will escape His wrath in the last days. Notice at the end of verse 17 there's a question. Who shall be able to... To stand. Revelation 7 helps us understand who will be able to stand or abide the catastrophes of the sixth seal. So let's start with Revelation chapter 7, verse 1. And after these things I saw four angels standing on the four corners of the earth, holding the four winds of the earth, that the wind should not blow on the earth, nor on the sea, nor on any tree. Now here, the winds they are holding back have power to destroy life on earth. We talked about that in Doctrine and Covenants section 86, verses 5 through 7. Going on with verse 2. And I saw another angel ascending from the east, having the seal of the living God. And he cried with a loud voice to the four angels, to whom it was given to hurt the earth and the sea, saying, Hurt not the earth, neither the sea, nor the trees, till we have sealed the servants of our God in their foreheads. The Institute Manual says, The Lord gave Joseph Smith understanding concerning the angels mentioned in Revelation chapter 7, verses 1 and 2. Revelation chapter 7, verse 1 refers to four angels, the four corners of the earth, and the four winds of the earth. The number four in the scriptures often suggests a geographical fullness, as in the four directions on a compass. Regarding the angels of destruction, President Wilfred Woodruff taught, God has held the angels of destruction for many years, lest they should reap down the wheat with the tares. But I want to tell you now that those angels have left the portals of heaven and are hovering over the earth, waiting to pour out the judgments, And from this very day they shall be poured out. Calamities and troubles are increasing in the earth, and there is a meaning to these things. Remember this, and reflect upon these matters. If you do your duty, and I do my duty, we'll have protection, and shall pass through the afflictions in peace and safety. This is from the Discourses of Wilford Woodruff. But what about verse 3 and the servants of God who are sealed in their foreheads? The Institute Manual has this commentary. The sealing or marking of the servants of our God in their foreheads is a metaphor of their devotion, service, and belonging to God. Seal is the same term used earlier in the New Testament to describe faithful baptized saints who had received the Holy Spirit of promise. Bearing this seal protects the faithful from divine judgments upon the wicked. In this sense, the seal of God in the forehead symbolizes a protection much like the lamb's blood that ancient Israelites in Egypt placed on their door frames to protect them from the destroying angel. The prophet Joseph Smith taught that the sealing of the faithful in their foreheads, quote, signifies sealing the blessing upon their heads, meaning the everlasting covenant, thereby making their calling and election sure. End quote. That's from the History of the Church, Volume 5. We'll talk about that further when we cover Revelation 22, verse 4. Also, we will see the condition of those who do not have this seal in Revelation chapter 9. Oh, yes. 
Now, in chapter 7, verses 4 through 8, John saw that 12,000 were sealed of each of the tribes of Israel, making 144,000 in all. The prophet Joseph Smith learned that, quote, the number 144,000 mentioned is the number of ordained high priests out of the 12 tribes of Israel who will assist others in their quest for exaltation. It is not, as some people believe, the total number of people who will be exalted. Close quote. And here's an interesting riddle that we unfortunately don't have the answer to yet. There are 12 groups of 12,000, totaling 144,000, but not all the tribes of Israel are represented. Notice that verse 6 mentions the tribe of Manasseh, but verse 8 mentions the tribe of Joseph. If you'll recall, Manasseh was Joseph's son. The fact that Manasseh is called out separately means that in order to maintain 12 groups of 12,000 each, one of Israel's sons is missing. In this case, it's Dan. Dan is not mentioned. And again, unfortunately, the reason has not yet been revealed. Interesting. So, John saw four angels sent from God who have power to both save and destroy life on earth, as it says in verse 1. John foresaw these angels preparing to pour out destruction upon the earth in preparation for the Savior's second coming. He also saw protection being given to members of the tribes of Israel, verses 1 through 8, and then saw a vision of the celestial kingdom. So let's pick it up in verse 9. After this I beheld, and lo, a great multitude, which no man could number, of all nations and kindreds and people and tongues, stood before the throne, and before the Lamb, clothed with white robes and palms in their hands. Now palm branches can symbolize victory and joy. Think of the Savior's triumphal entry into Jerusalem. Verse 10, And cried with a loud voice, saying, Salvation to our God, which sitteth upon the throne, and unto the Lamb. And all the angels stood round about the throne, and about the elders, and the four beasts, and fell before the throne on their faces, and worshipped God, saying, Amen, blessing, and glory, and wisdom, and thanksgiving, and honor, and power, and might be unto our God for ever and ever. Amen. What a joyous vision! But what do we learn about what they did to get to be in the presence of God? Let's look at verse 13. And one of the elders answered, saying unto me, What are these which are arrayed in white robes? And whence came they? And I said unto him, Sir, thou knowest. And he said unto me, These are they which came out of great tribulation, and have washed their robes, and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. This refers to being purified through the atonement of Christ. We'll learn in Revelation 19.18 that these white robes are the righteousness of the saints. Going on in verse 15. Therefore are they before the throne of God, and serve him day and night in his temple. And he that sitteth on the throne shall dwell among them. They shall hunger no more, neither thirst any more. Neither shall the sun light on them, nor any heat. For the Lamb which is in the midst of the throne shall feed them, and shall lead them unto living fountains of waters, and God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes. So, as you envision this scene in the celestial kingdom of God, what blessings are most meaningful to you? What do you feel inspired to change in your life so that you can receive them? Now, before we move on, Here is a graphic from the seminary manual that will review chapters 6 and 7 and the descriptions of the opening of the various seals. Notice the number of verses associated with the seals. 11 for the first through the fifth seals. 16 for the sixth seal. But 211 verses for the seventh seal, which includes the second coming of Christ, and 15 more for the millennium and final judgment. (laughs) Wow! Does that give you a perspective on the focus of this vision? Chapter 8 through the rest of Revelation will focus on what will come to pass. And that brings us to Revelation chapter 8. The Institute Manual tells us, John beheld a short period of silence when the seventh seal was opened, a time when the angels of heaven are awaiting the command to execute the Lord's justice. 
Zephaniah described a similar period of silence that preceded the ancient destruction of Judah. The Lord's judgment and intervention are described as times when the Lord does not keep silent. Following this period of silence, John saw fire and desolation poured out during the seventh seal and preceding the second coming of Christ. Because the number seven often symbolizes completion, the destructions of the seventh seal may be seen as preparing for the completion of God's work on earth. These destructions are described in Revelation chapter 8 verse 6 through chapter 9 verse 21 and chapter 11 verses 1 through 19. Great. Now in Revelation 8, the first six verses describe the Savior opening the seventh seal. John saw an angel take fire of the altar and cast it into the earth, in verse 5, symbolizing the judgments of God to be rained down upon the wicked during the opening part of the seventh seal. John saw seven angels who were given seven trumpets. In this instance, blowing the trumpets would signal the onset of various plagues and destructions in preparation for Jesus Christ's millennial reign. So, what happens when each trumpet sounds? We'll read the selection of verses and include some commentary from a chart included in the Institute Student Manual. So let's start with the first trumpet, Revelation chapter 8, verse 7. The first angel sounded, and there followed hail and fire mingled with blood, and they were cast upon the earth. And the third part of trees was burnt up, and all green grass was burnt up. Elder Bruce R. McConkie says, quote, Speculatively, most of the plagues and destructions here announced could be brought to pass by men themselves as they use weapons and armaments they have created. Close quote. This is from his book, The Millennial Messiah. On to the second trumpet, verse 8. And the second angel sounded. And as it were, a great mountain burning with fire was cast into the sea. And the third part of the sea became blood. And the third part of the creatures which were in the sea and had life died, and the third part of the ships were destroyed. Elder Bruce R. McConkie says, quote, Perhaps the turning of the waters of Egypt to blood was in similitude of this great Latter-day plague. Close quote. This is from his Doctrinal New Testament commentary. That's an interesting thought. Let's move on to the third trumpet, verse 10. And the third angel sounded, and there fell a great star from heaven, burning as it were a lamp. And it fell upon the third part of the rivers and upon the fountains of waters. And the name of the star is called Wormwood. And the third part of the waters became Wormwood. And many men died of the waters because they were made bitter. The Institute Manual includes this quote from Elder Bruce R. McConkie, quote, Could this result from atomic fallout or pollutions from the factories of the world? Or will it be brought to pass by some law of nature beyond our control? Close quote. Again, quoting from his book, Millennial Messiah. The Institute Manual goes on to say, Regarding the star John identified as wormwood, wormwood was a plant with an extremely bitter taste. The star named wormwood that fell from heaven may symbolize the bitterness and awfulness that comes to all who follow the devil. Wormwood is also a character from C.S. Lewis's book, The Screwtape Letters, and is also the name of Calvin's teacher in the comic strip Calvin and Hobbes. An interesting bit of trivia. (laughs) Let's go on to the fourth trumpet, verse 12. And the fourth angel sounded, and the third part of the sun was smitten, and the third part of the moon, and the third part of the stars, so as the third part of them was darkened, and the day shone not for a third part of it, and the night likewise. And I beheld and heard an angel flying through the midst of heaven, saying with a loud voice, Woe, woe, woe to the inhabitants of the earth, by reason of the other voices of the trumpet of the three angels, which are yet to sound. Those three woes will be forthcoming. The first of them will be when the next trumpet sounds. Revelation chapter 9, verse 1. And the fifth angel sounded. And I saw a star fall from heaven unto the earth, and to him was given the key of the bottomless pit. Now, Revelation 9.1 symbolically describes the final efforts of Satan and his followers prior to the final destructions of the wicked. Satan is depicted as a star fallen from heaven. The Joseph Smith translation clarifies that the key was given not to Satan, 
but to the angel, who then opened the bottomless pit. This reading emphasizes that God has ultimate control and that Satan has power only as God allows. At the beginning of the millennium, God will bind Satan and his followers. Going on in chapter 9, verse 2. And he opened the bottomless pit, and there arose a smoke out of the pit, as the smoke of a great furnace, and the sun and the air were darkened by reason of the smoke of the pit. And there came out of the smoke locusts upon the earth, and unto them was given power, as the scorpions of the earth have power. The smoke in Revelation chapter 9 verses 2 and 3 is reminiscent of the mists of darkness in Lehi's vision of the tree of life. The smoke that emerges from the bottomless pit darkens the skies, similar to how the mists of darkness in Lehi's vision obscured the view of the tree of life. The smoke may allude to all of Satan's false philosophies, temptations, deceptions, and attempts in the last days to destroy righteousness upon the earth. Let's go on with verse 4. And it was commanded them that they should not hurt the grass of the earth, neither any green thing, neither any tree, but only those men which have not the seal of God in their foreheads. The Institute Manual tells us that the descriptions of judgments upon the wicked in Revelation 8 continue in Revelation 9. The Apostle John saw that certain calamities preceding the second coming would not affect all the earth or its inhabitants, but only those men which have not the seal of God in their foreheads. This corresponds with other scriptural promises that in the last days, those who are faithful will ultimately be protected. President Gordon B. Hinckley emphasized that spiritual preparation should be our first priority when seeking protection from the calamities of the last days. Quote, Someone has said it was not raining when Noah built the ark, but he built it, and the rains came. The Lord has said... If ye are prepared, ye shall not fear. The primary preparation is also set forth in the Doctrine and Covenants, wherein it says, Wherefore stand ye in holy places, and be not moved, until the day of the Lord come. We can so live, that we can call upon the Lord for His protection and guidance. This is a first priority. We cannot expect His help if we are unwilling to keep his commandments. Close quote. This is referencing his talk from the October 2005 General Conference. The Institute Manual goes on, Though the Lord promises protection to the righteous in the last days, the prophet Joseph Smith clarified that some who are righteous may lose their lives in the trials and calamities of the last days. Quote, I explain concerning the coming of the Son of Man, also that it is a false idea that the saints will escape all the judgments, whilst the wicked suffer. For all flesh is subject to suffer, and the righteous shall hardly escape. Still, many of the saints will escape, for the just shall live by faith, yet many of the righteous shall fall prey to disease, to pestilence, etc., by reason of the weakness of the flesh, and yet be saved in the kingdom of God. Close quote. This is quoted from the manual Teachings of Presidents of the Church, Joseph Smith. Going back to Revelation 9. Verse 5, And to them it was given that they should not kill them, but that they should be tormented five months. And their torment was as the torment of a scorpion when he striketh a man. And in those days shall men seek death and shall not find it, and shall desire to die, and death shall flee from them. And the shapes of the locusts were like unto horses prepared unto battle, and on their heads were, as it were, crowns like gold, And their faces were as the faces of men, and they had hair as the hair of women, and their teeth were as the teeth of lions, and they had breastplates as it were breastplates of iron, and the sound of their wings was as the sound of chariots of many horses running to battle. And they had tails like unto scorpions, and there were stings in their tails, and their power was to hurt men five months. And they had a king over them, which is the angel of the bottomless pit, whose name in the Hebrew tongue is Abaddon, but in the Greek tongue hath his name Apollyon. These are names that come from terms meaning destruction. Verse 12, One woe is past, and behold, there come two woes more hereafter. Now remember in Revelation 8 verse 13, 
and Angel announced three woes. One down, two more to go. Elder Bruce R. McConkie discussed the meaning of the three woes. Quote, After showing John the woes that would befall mankind before the second coming, the Lord, by an angelic ministrant, promised three more woes, which were to attend and usher in the reign of the great king. The first of these was the unbelievably destructive series of wars leading up to the final great holocaust. The second was the final great war itself, in which one-third of the hosts of men should be slain. And now the third woe is to be the destruction of the remainder of the wicked when the vineyard is burned by divine power and the earth changes from its telestial to its terrestrial state. Close quote. This is from his doctrinal New Testament commentary. Going on in the Institute Manual, John used images familiar to him to describe war and destruction in the last days. Locusts and scorpions are often associated in the scriptures with torment and destruction. Iron, horses, and chariots are images of warfare. Elder Bruce R. McConkie discussed possible meanings of the warfare described in Revelation chapter 9. Quote, John here seeks to describe a war fought with weapons and under circumstances entirely foreign to any experience of his own or of the people of that day. Joel, subject to the same limitations of descriptive ability, attempted to portray the same scenes in the words found in Joel chapter 2 verses 1 through 11. It is not improbable that these ancient prophets were seeing such things as men wearing or protected by strong armor as troops of cavalry, and companies of tanks and flamethrowers, as airplanes and airborne missiles which explode, fire shells and drop bombs, and even other weapons yet to be devised in an age when warfare is the desire and love of wicked men. Close quote. Again from his Doctrinal New Testament commentary. Let's go back to Revelation 9, verse 13. And the sixth angel sounded... And I heard a voice from the four horns of the golden altar, which is before God, saying to the sixth angel, which had the trumpet, Loose the four angels which are bound in the great river Euphrates. And the four angels were loosed, which were prepared for an hour and a day and a month and a year for to slay the third part of men. And the number of the army of the horsemen were two hundred thousand thousand, and I heard the number of them. Skipping to verse 18. By these three was the third part of men killed by the fire and by the smoke and by the brimstone which issued out of their mouths. Thinking of the symbolism being used, I wonder if this horrible destruction may also be spiritual. Out of the mouths of these horses issued smoke and brimstone, like the other dark mists and smoke referred to earlier in the chapter in verse 2. Perhaps they represent the temptations and deceptions of Satan coming forth from the mouths of his servants. Doctrine and Covenants section 93 verse 39 reads, And that wicked one cometh and taketh away light and truth through disobedience. And so I wonder if we might also be speaking of a spiritual component to this destruction as well. Now, we do not know whether that number, 200,000 thousand or 200 million, is symbolic or literal. John also recorded that the third part of men will be slain in verse 15. Of this prophecy, Elder Bruce R. McConkie stated, quote, The slain will be a third of the inhabitants of the earth itself, however many billions of people that may turn out to be, end quote. That comes from his book, Millennial Messiah. And how do the wicked who survived all this respond? Let's take a look in Revelation 9, verse 20. And the rest of the men which were not killed by these plagues yet repented not of the works of their hands, that they should not worship devils and idols of gold and silver and brass and stone and of wood, which neither can see nor hear nor walk. Neither repented they of their murders, nor of their sorceries, nor of their fornication, nor of their thefts. The Institute Manual includes this quote from Elder David R. Stone. This is from a talk he gave in the April 2006 General Conference. He taught that a prevalent form of modern idolatry is adopting the tastes and attitudes of the worldly culture that surrounds us. He says, quote, Our culture tends to determine what foods we like, how we dress, what constitutes 
polite behavior, what sports we should follow, what our taste in music should be, the importance of education, and our attitudes toward honesty. It also influences men as to the importance of recreation or religion, influences women about the priority of career or childbearing, and has a powerful effect on how we approach procreation and moral issues. All too often, we are like puppets on a string, as our culture determines what is cool. Seduced by our culture, we often hardly recognize our idolatry, as our strings are pulled by that which is popular in the Babylonian world. Close quote. Nice. So true. Now there is one more trumpet, but we have to wait for that until chapter 11. We're going to take a break now, move to Revelation chapter 10. This chapter contains a pause in the narrative of the seven trumpet soundings and their associated plagues. We read in this chapter that John was instructed by another angel. So let's start in Revelation chapter 10, verse 1. And I saw another mighty angel come down from heaven, clothed with a cloud, and a rainbow was upon his head, and his face was as it were the sun, and his feet as pillars of fire. And he had in his hand a little book open, and he set his right foot upon the sea, and his left foot on the earth. And he cried with a loud voice, as when a lion roareth. And when he had cried, seven thunders uttered their voices. Skipping to verse 8. And the voice which I heard from heaven spake unto me again, and said, Go, and take the little book which is open in the hand of the angel, which standeth upon the sea and upon the earth. And I went unto the angel, and said unto him, Give me the little book. And he said unto me, Take it, and eat it up, and it shall make thy belly bitter, but it shall be in thy mouth sweet as honey. And I took the little book out of the angel's hand, and ate it up, and it was in my mouth sweet as honey, and as soon as I had eaten it, my belly was bitter. And he said unto me, Thou must prophesy again before many peoples, and nations, and tongues, and kings." The Institute Manual tells us, A mighty angel delivered a little book to John, and he ate it up, symbolizing his mission to help gather the tribes of Israel as part of the Restoration. Eating the book may suggest that John accepted his mission. It became a part of his being. That the book was sweet as honey in John's mouth, but bitter in his belly, may suggest that his mission would involve many sweet and joyous experiences, but also rejection and painful experiences. Ezekiel also ate or internalized a book. According to John Whitmer's account of a conference of the church in June 1831, quote, The Spirit of the Lord fell upon Joseph in an unusual manner, and he prophesied that John the Revelator was then among the ten tribes of Israel, who had been led away by Shalmaneser, king of Assyria, to prepare them for their return from their long dispersion to again possess the land of their fathers. End quote. That's from History of the Church, Volume 1. And that brings us to Revelation chapter 11. This chapter begins with John's description of the events that will precede the sounding of the seventh trumpet and the second coming of Jesus Christ in verse 15. During this time, the wicked will have more power and control over the earth, and an army will seek to overrun Jerusalem. Let's pick it up in verse 3. And I will give power unto my two witnesses, and they shall prophesy a thousand two hundred and threescore days clothed in sackcloth. These are the two olive trees and the two candlesticks standing before the God of the earth. And if any man will hurt them, fire proceedeth out of their mouth and devoureth their enemies. And if any man will hurt them, he must in this manner be killed. These have power to shut heaven, that it rain not in the days of their prophecy, and have power over waters to turn them to blood, and to smite the earth with all plagues as often as they will. Now thinking in terms of symbolism, the fire that will proceed out of their mouth in verse 5 could be symbolic of the power of the testimonies they will bear. Look at these descriptions in Jeremiah in the Old Testament. Jeremiah chapter 5 verse 14 says, 
Wherefore, thus saith the Lord God of hosts, Because ye speak this word, behold, I will make my words in thy mouth fire, and this people wood, and it shall devour them. Also, note what we learn about these two witnesses from the Q&A in Doctrine and Covenants section 77. Verse 15. Question. What is to be understood by the two witnesses in the 11th chapter of Revelation? Answer. They are two prophets that are to be raised up to the Jewish nation in the last days, at the time of the restoration, and to prophesy to the Jews after they are gathered and have built the city of Jerusalem in the land of their fathers. The Institute Manual says, The events in Revelation chapter 11 will transpire prior to the Savior's coming to the Mount of Olives to deliver the Jews from destruction. These two prophets appear to possess the sealing power of the priesthood, with which they, like prophets before them, are able to control the skies and smite the earth with plagues. Elder Bruce R. McConkie stated, quote, No doubt they will be members of the Council of the Twelve or the First Presidency of the Church. Close quote. That's from his Doctrinal New Testament commentary. Let's go back to Revelation chapter 11, verse 7. And when they shall have finished their testimony, the beast that ascendeth out of the bottomless pit shall make war against them, and shall overcome them, and kill them. And their dead bodies shall lie in the street of the great city, which spiritually is called Sodom and Egypt, where also our Lord was crucified. And they of the people and kindreds and tongues and nations shall see their dead bodies three days and an half, and shall not suffer their dead bodies to be put in graves. Notice how this corresponds to what we learn in Zechariah chapter 14, verse 2. For I will gather all nations against Jerusalem to battle, and the city shall be taken, and the houses rifled, and the women ravished, and half of the city shall go forth into captivity, and the residue of the people shall not be cut off from the city. Let's continue, though, in Revelation 11, verse 10. And they that dwell upon the earth shall rejoice over them these two slain witnesses of the Lord, going on, and make merry, and shall send gifts one to another, because these two prophets tormented them that dwelt on the earth. And after three days and a half, the spirit of life from God entered into them, and they stood upon their feet, and great fear fell upon them which saw them. And they heard a great voice from heaven saying unto them, Come up hither. And they ascended up to heaven in a cloud and their enemies beheld them. The seminary manual points out, it is on the Mount of Olives in Jerusalem that the Savior suffered in the Garden of Gethsemane as part of his atonement. The Mount of Olives is also where the Savior will go forth and fight against those nations that seek to destroy the Jews before his appearance to all the world. The Doctrine and Covenants describes the event this way. This is Doctrine and Covenants section 45, verses 48 through 53. And then shall the Lord set his foot upon this mount, the Mount of Olives, and it shall cleave in twain, and the earth shall tremble and reel to and fro, and the heavens also shall shake. And the Lord shall utter his voice, and all the ends of the earth shall hear it, and the nations of the earth shall mourn, and they that have laughed shall see their folly. And calamity shall cover the mocker, and the scorner shall be consumed, And they that have watched for iniquity shall be hewn down and cast into the fire. And then shall the Jews look upon me and say, What are these wounds in thine hands and in thy feet? Then shall they know that I am the Lord. For I will say unto them, These wounds are the wounds with which I was wounded in the house of my friends. I am he who was lifted up. I am Jesus that was crucified. I am the Son of God. And then shall they weep because of their iniquities. Then shall they lament because they persecuted their king. Going back to Revelation chapter 11, let's take a look at verse 14. The second woe is past, and behold, the third woe cometh quickly. And the seventh angel sounded, and there were great voices in heaven, saying, The kingdoms of this world are become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ, and he shall reign forever and ever. Now, this will be the last time, but I have to point out that Handel used the saying of these great voices in heaven in verse 15 in his famous Hallelujah Chorus, movement number 44 of Messiah. 
If you only listen to one of our Messiah suggestions, make it this one. We'll include a link in the description. Excellent. Now, in verses 16 through 19, the 24 elders gave thanks and praise to God for rewarding the just and punishing the wicked. John also saw in vision the heavenly temple of God and the Ark of the Covenant, which represents God's presence. And that brings us to Revelation chapter 12. In this chapter, John wrote about the pre-mortal war in heaven. It's an interlude or pause in John's vision of the events of the seventh seal. The Lord may have been helping John understand the meaning of the phrases, the kingdoms of this world and the kingdoms of our Lord in Revelation 11:15. This interlude will continue through chapter 14. The Institute Manual says, the kingdoms interlude, chapters 12 through 14, is the longest and perhaps the most difficult interlude to understand. The three chapters seem to comprise an overview of mankind's history from the premortal existence to the second coming, as it pertains to the kingdoms of the Lamb, Jesus Christ, and the dragon, Satan. When John hears that the kingdoms of the world are to become the kingdoms of Christ, it is as though the Lord stops to teach more about these two different classes of kingdoms. And let's take a look at that, starting with Revelation 12, verse 1. And there appeared a great wonder in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun and the moon under her feet, and upon her head a crown of twelve stars. And she, being with child, cried, travailing in birth, means she's in labor, and pained to be delivered. Note that the Joseph Smith translation, footnoted in verse 1a, places verse 5 directly after verse 2. So let's read it that way. Verse 5. And she brought forth a man-child who was to rule all nations with a rod of iron, and her child was caught up unto God and to his throne. Now let's include verses 3 and 4. And there appeared another wonder in heaven, and behold a great red dragon, having seven heads and ten horns, and seven crowns upon his heads. And his tail drew the third part of the stars of heaven, and did cast them to the earth. And this is symbolic of the large number of Heavenly Father's spirit children who chose to follow Satan in the pre-existence. Going on. And the dragon stood before the woman which was ready to be delivered for to devour her child as soon as it was born. Okay, so let's look at some of this imagery. For some help, let's look at the Joseph Smith translation for verses 7 through 8 found by clicking the footnote 1a or going straight to the Bible appendix. Verse 7. And the dragon prevailed not against Michael, neither the child, nor the woman which was the church of God, who had been delivered of her pains, and brought forth the kingdom of our God and his Christ. Neither was there place found in heaven for the great dragon, who was cast out, that old serpent called the devil, and also called Satan, which deceiveth the whole world. He was cast out into the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. Okay, so the woman represents the church of God, as we find in verse 7. The woman's child is the kingdom of our God and his Christ, also verse 7. And remember back in verse 5, we talked about the woman's child, that he ruled with a rod of iron? If you'll remember Lehi's dream we learn that the rod of iron is the word of God. So that's really cool. But also in verse 8 here, the great dragon is Satan. The Institute Manual says, These clarifications confirm that Satan will not prevail in his war against God's kingdom on earth. They also teach that the woman represents the church of God and that the child she gives birth to is the kingdom of our God and his Christ. The Church of God is at this time an ecclesiastical organization only, but when the Savior comes again and makes a full end of all nations, the kingdom of God will also have political jurisdiction over all people on the earth. The purpose of the Church is to prepare its members to live forever in the celestial kingdom or kingdom of heaven. During the millennium, the kingdom of God will be both political and ecclesiastical. The Institute Manual also tells us, We learn from Latter-day Scripture that those who inherit the celestial kingdom will receive glory like unto that of the Son. 
The image of a woman clothed with the sun may symbolize the church's role in preparing its members for the future glory of the celestial kingdom. The crown of twelve stars upon the head of the woman likely refers to the twelve apostles who preside over the affairs of the church under Jesus Christ's direction. John also saw the moon under the woman's feet. Elder Bruce R. McConkie of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles explained a possible meaning of this image, quote, As the moon shines by reflected light, so do all earthly churches and kingdoms. They are under, beneath, and lower than the true church. The highest eternal reward they can offer is the terrestrial kingdom, whose glory is like the moon, end quote. This comes from his book, Doctrinal New Testament Commentary. And the Institute Manual also says these verses in Revelation chapter 12 are a parenthetical reference to the war in heaven. The dragon is a representation of Satan, who, with his followers, waged the war in heaven against Heavenly Father and his faithful children. The third part of the stars of heaven are that portion of the hosts of heaven who followed Satan in the pre-mortal war in heaven and were cast out. Elder Bruce R. McConkie described the conflict that occurred in heaven. Quote, what kind of war? The same kind that prevails on earth. The only kind Satan and spirit beings can wage. A war of words. A tumult of opinions. A conflict of ideologies. A war between truth and error. Between light and darkness. And the battle lines are still drawn. It is now on earth as it was then in heaven. Every man must choose which general he will follow. Close quote. Again from his doctrinal New Testament commentary. President Boyd K. Packer of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles elaborated on how we can find protection during this spiritual war. Quote, Satan is determined to disrupt our Heavenly Father's plan and seeks to control the minds and actions of all. This influence is spiritual, and he is abroad in the land. But despite the opposition, trials, and temptations, you need not fail or fear. Youth today are being raised in enemy territory with a declining standard of morality. But as a servant of the Lord, I promise that you will be protected and shielded from the attacks of the adversary if you will heed the promptings that come from the Holy Spirit. Close quote. This is from his October 2011 General Conference talk. Awesome. So what is Satan's intent according to the vision? Verse 4 tells us that Satan desires to devour or destroy the kingdom of God and Christ. Look for what the woman, the church of God, did in verse 6. And the woman fled into the wilderness where she hath a place prepared of God, that they should feed her there a thousand two hundred and threescore days. Or the Joseph Smith translation changes that to years. The 2016 Seminary Manual tells us, The woman fleeing into the wilderness represents the church entering the great apostasy and the priesthood being taken from the earth after the apostles' death. Let's take a look now at the Joseph Smith translation for Revelation chapter 12, verses 6 through 11. Here, verses 7 and 8 are being repeated, starting in verse 6. And there was a war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon, and the dragon and his angels fought against Michael. And the dragon prevailed not against Michael, neither the child nor the woman which was the church of God, who had been delivered of her pains, and brought forth the kingdom of our God and his Christ. Neither was there place found in heaven for the great dragon, who was cast out, that old serpent called the devil, and also called Satan, which deceiveth the whole world. He was cast out into the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. And I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, Now is come salvation and strength and the kingdom of our God, and the power of his Christ. For the accuser of our brethren is cast down, which accused them before our God day and night. For they have overcome him by the blood of the Lamb, and by the word of their testimony, meaning through the Savior's atonement, and by remaining true to their testimonies of the gospel. Going on. For they loved not their own lives, but kept the testimony even unto death. Therefore, Rejoice, O heavens, and ye that dwell in them. 
You know, I was struck this time as we were reading them how Satan is called the accuser. And in verse 10, he accuses our brethren day and night. Look at that compared to Christ, who is the advocate before the Father day and night. Satan, the accuser. Christ, the mediator, the advocate. Easy choice. The Institute Manual tells us the Joseph Smith translation adds several words to Revelation chapter 12, verse 11. They loved not their own lives, but kept the testimony even unto death. This addition suggests that Christ's followers valued and loved their testimonies of the Lord and his gospel more than their own lives. There are multiple references in the book of Revelation to individuals who were tested and tried in the war against evil, even unto death. The loud voice from heaven continued to speak to John by declaring that the heavens and ye that dwell in them should rejoice because of the righteousness of the saints. The Joseph Smith translation then adds these further insights. And after these things I heard another voice saying, Woe to the inhabitants of the earth, yea, and they who dwell upon the islands of the sea, for the devil is come down unto you, having great wrath. The phrase, after these things, may indicate that the righteous had a period of rejoicing after the war in heaven, for good had triumphed over evil. However, after this period, there came a time of woe on the earth, because Satan and his followers came down to earth with great wrath. The 2016 Seminary Manual includes this quote from Elder James J. Hamula. This is from his October 2008 General Conference. He says, quote, Reserved to come forth in these last days and labor for our Father and His Son are some of the most valiant and noble of our Father's sons and daughters. Their valiance and nobility were demonstrated in the pre-earth struggle with Satan. With God's kingdom restored to the earth and your entry into the world, Satan knows that he hath but a short time— Therefore, Satan is marshalling every resource at his disposal to entice you into transgression. He knows that if he can draw you into transgression, he may prevent you from serving a full-time mission, marrying in the temple, and securing your future children in the faith, all of which weakens not only you, but the church. He knows that nothing can overthrow God's kingdom, save it be the transgression of his people." Make no mistake about it. The focus of his war is now on you. Close quote. Also, Elder Richard G. Scott has a great talk from October 2001 General Conference. He says, quote, A strong testimony gives peace, comfort, and assurance. It generates the conviction that as the teachings of the Savior are consistently obeyed, life will be beautiful, the future secure, and there will be capacity to overcome the challenges that cross our path. A testimony grows from understanding truth, distilled from prayer and the pondering of scriptural doctrine. It is nurtured by living those truths in faith and the secure confidence that the promised results will be obtained. Your personal security and happiness depend upon the strength of your testimony for it will guide your actions in times of trial and uncertainty. Close quote. Now, that war in heaven continues here on earth. Remember where Satan and his followers were cast out to? Verse 8 tells us that it was here on earth. Going back to Revelation chapter 12, verse 12. Therefore rejoice, ye heavens, and ye that dwell in them. Woe to the inhabitants of the earth and of the sea! For the devil is come down unto you, having great wrath, because he knoweth that he hath but a short time. Skipping to verse 17. And the dragon was wroth with the woman, and went to make war with the remnant of her seed, which keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. So these include the faithful members of the restored Church of Jesus Christ today. Now, if you're interested in a summary of what we know on the subject of the war in heaven— Check out the Topics and Questions section of your Gospel Library for War in Heaven. There are lots of great resources and talks in there. We'll include a link in the description. And that brings us to Revelation chapter 13. 
In this chapter, John saw a vision of fierce-looking beasts that represent wicked earthly kingdoms controlled by Satan. John also saw that through these kingdoms, Satan would work wonders and false miracles to deceive the inhabitants of the earth. The Institute Manual tells us, though the intended meaning of much of the symbolism in Revelation 13 is uncertain, one message seems clear. Satan and those who uphold his work will be at war against the saints of God. Great summary. The Institute Manual also says, after seeing that Satan went to make war against the remnant of the seed of the woman, John saw a beast rise out of the sea. The Joseph Smith translation indicates that the beast is in the likeness of the kingdoms of the earth. You can find that in Revelation 13.1 footnote A. The beast's many heads, crowns, and horns suggest many different kingdoms and rulers with great power. The prophet Joseph Smith taught, quote, When God made use of the figure of a beast in visions to the prophets, he did it to represent those kingdoms which had degenerated and become corrupt, savage, and beast-like in their dispositions, even the degenerate kingdoms of the wicked world. Close quote. That's quoted from the History of the Church, Volume 5. Now, rather than attempting to specify an exact identity of the beast, it may be more profitable to note the following general characteristics about the beast— It had power over many nations, verses 1 and 7. It opposed God and blasphemed against him, verses 5 and 6. The power it wielded was like the power that predatory animals have over their prey, verse 2. Satan gave it power, verses 2 and 4. People of the world worshipped or followed the beast, verse 4. And it was able to overpower many, including the saints, verse 7. It could be said that any kingdom or government that exhibits these characteristics manifests the spirit of the beast. Revelation 17, verses 8 through 12 contain additional information about the beast, including its ultimate destruction. Going on in Revelation 13, verse 11, And I beheld another beast coming up out of the earth. And he had two horns like a lamb, and he spake as a dragon. The Institute Manual says, Revelation 13.11 tells of a second beast that John saw. He later identified this beast as the false prophet in Revelation 19.20. This second beast had two horns like a lamb, but spake as a dragon. This description suggests that the second beast will seek to appear to represent Christ while actually teaching the false doctrines of Satan. The description of the second beast is also reminiscent of the Savior's warning to beware of false prophets, which come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravening wolves. President James E. Faust of the First Presidency noted, quote, Satan is the great imitator, the master deceiver, the arch counterfeiter, and the greatest forger ever in the history of the world. He comes into our lives as a thief in the night. His disguise is so perfect that it is hard to recognize him or his methods. Close quote. This is from a talk in the April 2003 General Conference. The Bible Dictionary, under the heading Devil, says one of the major techniques of the devil is to cause human beings to think they are following God's ways when in reality they are deceived by the devil to follow other paths. Let's go back to Revelation 13, verse 16. And he, this is the false prophet, causeth all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond, to receive a mark in their right hand or in their foreheads, and that no man might buy or sell save he that had the mark or the name of the beast or the number of his name. The Institute Manual says, In contrast to the righteous, who keep their covenants with God and receive his protecting seal on their foreheads, the wicked who worship the beast receive a mark in their right hand or in their foreheads. This may symbolize that the wicked show by their actions, hands, and beliefs, heads, that they do the will of the beast and accept his ideology. However, the precise meaning of the mark has not been revealed. Going on in Revelation 13, verse 18, Here is wisdom. Let him that hath understanding count the number of the beast, 
for it is the number of a man, and his number is six hundred, threescore, and six. The Institute Manual tells us, John wrote that the number of the beast is six hundred, threescore, and six. Over the centuries, the number of the beast, 666, has intrigued countless individuals and led to many speculative interpretations. The Lord has not revealed the meaning of this symbolic number. Some commentators have noted that since six is one less than seven, a number representing divine perfection and completeness, 666 may emphasize the imperfect and counterfeit character of Satan and his followers. Now, a lot has been written and speculated about this verse and this number. Notice that verse 18 tells us that calculating the number of the beast, whatever that means, requires wisdom and understanding. Let's take a look at Daniel chapter 12, where, in speaking of these last days, the prophet Daniel teaches that the wise will know the times and meanings of his visions. Verse 10, Many shall be purified and made white and tried. But the wicked shall do wickedly, and none of the wicked shall understand. But the wise shall understand. So let's continue to be wise and pray for understanding. More will be revealed in time. Let's stay close to what we already have and trust the warnings and prophecies from those who have been called of God to lead His church in these latter days. Amen. And with that, let's go to Revelation chapter 14. In the first 13 verses, the Apostle Paul saw a vision of the latter days. In his vision, he saw the calamities that would come upon the wicked. He also saw what would bring peace to the righteous. Let's take a look at verse 1. And I looked, and lo, a lamb stood on the Mount Sion, and with him an hundred and forty-four thousand, having his father's name written in their foreheads. Now remember that the 144,000 are high priests of the 12 tribes of Israel who will be ordained from every nation to administer the gospel and bring people to the church. Going on with verse 2. And I heard a voice from heaven as the voice of many waters, and as the voice of a great thunder. And I heard the voice of harpers harping with their harps. And they sung, as it were, a new song before the throne and before the four beasts, and the elders, and no man could learn that song but the hundred and forty and four thousand, which were redeemed from the earth. These are they which were not defiled with women, for they are virgins. These are they which follow the Lamb whithersoever he goeth. These were redeemed from among men, being the firstfruits unto God and to the Lamb. And in their mouth was found no guile, meaning they were honest and sincere. Going on. For they are without fault before the throne of God, meaning that they were clean from sin. What great characteristics to have if you were to take the gospel to others. Chaste, honest, and clean from sin. I wonder if one reason these virtues helped the 144,000 take the gospel to all the world would be that those traits would be so unique in the last days. Those servants of the Lord would stand out, Be a light showing that true disciples of Jesus Christ followed a holier way. Living the light that is in them would make them even more powerful missionaries to others. And what about that new song mentioned in verse 3? Now, we're not sure, but it could be the same song we talked about in Doctrine and Covenants section 84. Verse 98 tells us that men and women who know the Lord and shall be filled with the knowledge of the Lord and shall see eye to eye and shall lift up their voice and with the voice together sing this new song. Again, we're not sure it's the same, but if it is, you can find the lyrics of the song in verses 99 to 102. That's really cool. Now, back to Revelation chapter 14 in verse 6, it says... And I saw another angel fly in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach unto them that dwell on the earth, and to every nation, and kindred, and tongue, and people. Check your footnotes for 6a. It gives this reference for Doctrine and Covenants section 133, verse 36. And now verily saith the Lord, that these things might be known among you, O inhabitants of the earth. I have sent forth mine angel, flying through the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel, who hath appeared unto some, and hath committed it unto man, who shall appear unto many that dwell on the earth. 
President Gordon B. Hinckley quoted Revelation 14.6 and then declared, quote, That angel has come. His name is Moroni. End quote. That's from the October 1995 General Conference. And did you notice what the angel did with the everlasting gospel? Preached it to everyone in every language. That is why we use the statue of the angel Moroni over our temples. These statues symbolize the preaching of the restored gospel throughout the world. Heavenly messengers, including Moroni, played an important role in the restoration of the gospel through the prophet Joseph Smith. The Institute Manual tells us the angel may also represent a composite of the many heavenly messengers, including Moroni, who have assisted in the Latter-day Restoration of the Gospel. Elder Bruce R. McConkie pointed out, quote, The angel Moroni brought the message, that is, the word, but other angels brought the keys and priesthood, the power, end quote. That's from his book, Doctrinal New Testament Commentary. Can you think of other angels that had significant roles in the restoration of the gospel of Jesus Christ? How about John the Baptist in Doctrine and Covenants 13? Or how about Moses, Elijah, and Elias in Doctrine and Covenants section 110? Well, and there's a whole list in Doctrine and Covenants 128 verses 20 through 21, like Peter, James, and John, and a number of others. It's interesting to think about. Very cool. Revelation 14 verse 7 saying with a loud voice, Fear God and give glory to him, for the hour of his judgment is come, and worship him that made heaven and earth and the sea and the fountains of waters. The 2016 Seminary Manual says, The time will come when Jesus Christ will judge all the people of the earth. His judgments will occur both at the second coming and at the final judgment. Next, a second angel speaks. Verse 8. And there followed another angel, saying, Babylon is fallen, is fallen, that great city, because she made all nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. One meaning of the phrase, Babylon is fallen, is that the day will come when the wickedness of the world will end. The Institute Manual says, Babylon's sin is described as fornication, meaning that the wicked of the world have been unfaithful in their relationship with God placing their affections and loyalties on false gods and inducing others to follow this manner of living. And then we have a third angel, verse 9. And the third angel followed them, saying with a loud voice, If any man worship the beast and his image and receive his mark in his forehead or in his hand, the same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out without mixture into the cup of his indignation. And he shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. And the smoke of their torment ascendeth up for ever and ever, and they have no rest day nor night, who worship the beast and his image, and whosoever receiveth the mark of his name. The 2016 Seminary Manual includes this quote from the prophet Joseph Smith. This is from the manual Teachings of Presidents of the Church, Joseph Smith. He says, quote, The great misery of departed spirits in the world of spirits, where they go after death, is to know that they come short of the glory that others enjoy, and that they might have enjoyed themselves, and they are their own accusers. A man is his own tormentor and his own condemner. Hence the saying, They shall go into the lake that burns with fire and brimstone. The torment of disappointment in the mind of man is as exquisite as a lake burning with fire and brimstone. Close quote. And in contrast, what will the righteous experience after they die? Let's take a look at verse 12. Here is the patience of the saints. Here are they that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. And I heard a voice from heaven saying unto me, Write, Blessed are the dead which die in the Lord from henceforth. Yea, saith the Spirit, that they may rest from their labors, and their works do follow them. Now in verses 14 through 20, John describes two harvests. In his vision, John saw that during the first harvest, the righteous would be gathered from the wicked, verses 14 through 16, and that during the second harvest, the wicked would be gathered and ultimately destroyed. That's verses 17 through 20. 
The Institute Manual tells us that the first harvest began when the gospel was restored in the latter days and will continue into the millennium. The second gathering represents God's judgments upon the wicked and the destruction that will come upon them when they, like grapes on the vine, are fully ripe in iniquity and are trodden in the winepress of the wrath of God. The seminary manual includes this quote from Elder Jeffrey R. Holland. This is from a New Era article from December 2013 called Preparing for the Second Coming. He says, quote, Because ours is the last and greatest of all dispensations, because all things will eventually culminate and be fulfilled in our era, there is, therefore, one particular, very specific responsibility that falls to those of us in the church now that did not rest quite the same way on the shoulders of church members in any earlier time. Unlike the church in the days of Abraham or Moses, Isaiah or Ezekiel, or even in the New Testament days of James and John, we have a responsibility to prepare the church of the Lamb of God to receive the Lamb of God in person, in triumphant glory, in his millennial role as Lord of Lords and King of Kings. No other dispensation ever had that duty. We have the responsibility as a church and as individual members of that church to be worthy to have Christ come to us, to be worthy to have him greet us, and to have him accept and receive and embrace us. The lives we present to him in that sacred hour must be worthy of him. End quote. Oh, that's amazing. What a great perspective, especially as we're studying Revelation and this particular time period. What amazing things we've learned today. I hope that you've done your best to follow the symbolism and to seek help from the Spirit and other references that we've suggested. And we also hope you found some gems. There were some great ones. Yeah, some wonderful things to learn and apply. Don't just worry about how they will apply in the future. Take them into your heart. Change your heart and your lives now to be more like our beloved Savior. Well, we're not quite done with the Revelation of John, so keep reading your scriptures And we'll talk about the remaining chapters in our next lesson. We'll see you then. This podcast is not officially affiliated with The Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. But we're really big fans.